Well, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mark McDonnell. I'm the sales director of Neogrid, uh, a company that you probably haven't heard of, but hopefully over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, you'll get a better idea of what um, we do uh, and uh, hopefully more interested uh, in essentially what, what we do. Today's topic is really about on-shelf availability. Now, um, uh, as all of us here within the, within the supply chain, then really we see the, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that you know, is very important on the basis that it is the ultimate measure of supply chain uh, effectiveness by actually getting the product in the shelf. So if, it, if the product is not on the shelf, then effectively the customer is going to go away disappointed uh, and so, you know, we, we've got to be able to, uh, to do that from a supply chain perspective. So today, um, what I'm really looking at is, uh, is how we can improve our understanding of what that particular uh, metric is, uh, how we can understand what the root causes are, and how, then what we can actually do about it. So, to try and give you some... Uh, uh, credentials, if you like, of why, you know, I, I, should I be uh, speaking here, is actually Neogrid is, is not that small a company. We're around sort of 700 uh, uh, supply chain professionals, but we basically come from Brazil. Now, South America and Brazil in particular is very interesting from an on-shelf availability perspective because all the retailers and the distributors within the company uh, country share their information with their suppliers uh, and um, about 70 to 80 percent of that is done over, over uh, my company's uh, software if you like um, now Brazil is around economically speaking it's about the same size as the UK um, but geographically speaking it obviously is is massive in fact if you take Alaska off uh, America, uh, then basically Brazil is bigger than the United States. Um, so you've got huge logistic uh, challenges with uh, an average, it actually takes four days to get from one end of the country to the other end of the country. Uh, the average uh, transit time is, is basically two days. So what that means for on-shelf availability is that if you don't collaborate, if you don't put the right stuff on the truck in the first place, then you're going to be left with huge gaps uh, uh, within your particular stores. So that's one of the major drivers uh, down there that, that essentially we can start to, to learn from. The other thing from that data, and there's about, I think we process something like 10 billion items of data a day, then we get a real good indication of what works within the supply chain and what doesn't work. And collaboration is clearly one of the, the areas that works um, actually extremely well. So very briefly, what we're about is basically synchronizing uh, that supply chain so that we can optimize uh, profitability through, if you like, a fast response, consumer demand. Now, everything you hear in the, in the uh, conference today is about speed, speed and more speed. Well, the speed of response is one thing, but also you have to have a speed of understanding uh, and the speed of which you can actually put preventative uh, measures in place to stop your stockouts uh, in the first place. So what we do to help that synchronization is basically uh, a number of things, starting with your internal collaboration, if you like, your SNOP type process, uh, or, or external collaboration through things like uh, collaborative planning, uh, forecasting, and replenishment. We then do a whole range of uh, replenishment uh, um, uh, areas. We've, uh, we've actually got 34 forecast engines that we basically take around three years' worth of data and we'll then forecast last year. And for each SKU in each location, we will then basically match the forecast algorithm with the lowest uh, uh, forecast error 
against that particular skew um, so that you can start to replenish um, uh, sensibly. Um, we also look at other types of replenishment um, solutions. We've got a, something called uh, um, demand-driven replenishment, which is essentially ignoring history completely uh, and then just uh, replenishing against your actual um, sales. Uh, and the advantage of that is that if you get an uplift in demand, uh, or indeed, uh, I was going to say downlift, but a drop in demand, uh, then um, statistical forecasting will take about three or four weeks to actually really register that, where, whereas with demand-driven uh, replenishment, within just one uh, replenishment cycle, you can start to monitor that, uh, and within three, you can start to effectively change it. So it can be much more... Uh, rapid in its, in its response. We then have the whole area of visibility, which is really demand uh, sensing and the sort of on-shelf availability uh, service that I'm going to describe uh, in more detail uh, in a moment. And then we also do a lot of strategic sourcing for some of the big retailers. So Tesco buys about £4 billion worth of goods over near grid software. Um, Kingfisher is another big customer, Auchan. So that's what we do. But how do we do this uh, synchronization? Well, what we try to do is basically give multi-tier uh, uh, visibility so that you can start to get closer to your consumer demand. Um, and we see that as the, the, if you like, the holy grail, of the, the, the ability to be able to use that uh, real consumption to then start to input into your planning process, whether it be demand planning or your SNOP process and so forth. So getting as close to the consumer demand as possible. We then add in the, the, uh, the algorithms, these 34 algorithms to, to, to basically um, use machine learning to, to uh, uh, actually get as, uh, as accurate uh, a forecast uh, as possible, and then we we automate it. So um, we can basically take just from sales data, basically uh, automate the complete supply chain, and then throw out exceptions to us humans, if you like, who can start to add value in the way that we add value, rather than just crunching through the data, where obviously the machines can generally do a better job. Um, <clears throat> and then from this, we can basically lower your operation and cost, increase your profitability, and, uh, and, and so forth. So what's the sort of uh, on-shelf availability landscape looking like at the moment? It clearly is dominated by the likes of uh, Amazon, but what, the, what pressures is that giving to, to retailers is really around the sheer convenience of using uh, online uh, broadening uh, assorts, assortments within, the, within shops and then also uh, allowing customer-specific customization. So, uh, you know, Amazon's obviously the Goliath, but it's now near around uh, um, a quarter of a million pounds worth of sales a minute, but the assortment with their marketplace is 368 million items. So, you know, fundamentally... Uh, different, and that is putting some real pressure on on uh, the normal uh, retail supply chain. What is the response to that? Well, uh, clearly going towards uh, anything omnichannel, customer engagement uh, uh, initiatives, uh, and then uh, assortment is changing uh, quite rapidly, as well as also techniques such as uh, click and collect and. Uh, um, in-store ordering, all having beneficial effects on the, the customer uh, uh, experience. However, um, customer experience programs, uh, you know, are very can be very beneficial. But if you don't get the product uh, onto the shelf or available on the on the website in the first instance, basically, you know, you are not going to win the consumer over. Now, as we talk to retailers and manufacturers around the, around the globe, we start to see that actually there's a, there's a disconnect 
between the perceived on-shelf availability and your actual on-shelf ability. Now, what I've put up here is, is, is grocery figures. Um, uh, so basically, it's perceived to be around in the UK around 97 to, to 99%. Um, however, when you actually get down to measure it, it, it tends to come out something between 94 and 96. And depending on your categories, that can actually change dramatically. So we do a lot of work with fashion retailers, for example, and there you're often seeing availability of down in the 60s, uh, and you're starting to target uh, actually 70 or between 70 and, uh, and 80% uh, availability. So depending on what type of channel you're, you're, you're going through can be very, very different. So why is that disconnect? Um, that disconnect can be because people are looking in the wrong, wrong place. Now, what are they measuring? They're measuring service levels to DCs. They're measuring uh, from DCs uh, through to stores, but they aren't necessarily measuring actually uh, your availability um, on, on the shelf. The second thing is that there's often uh, inaccurate data. So there's m been many industry studies that are basically saying uh, inventory data can be 60% you know, inaccurate, if you like. Now, it doesn't mean that, to say that we, we've got vastly uh, uh, inaccurate um, uh, information, but it does mean that you've got to start to look at your inventory data carefully and you can start to use the systems to actually start to clean that data. So a good example there is you may have something like a phantom inventory, which is essentially where you think you have stock, uh, but, you, but you haven't, and so you're, you're not selling uh, anything. If you can basically show and get trust uh, in, in that particular figure, then you can start to auto-correct that particular stock file uh, and therefore cleanse the data as, uh, as it goes through. So that's particularly important if you're trying to, to, to do that within a retail type environment because the stores tend to be the most difficult areas to actually uh, affect change uh, because of cultural issues, because of organizational issues. And so, um, you know, using data, using, uh, um, Data to, to basically cleanse the data or using systems to cleanse the data you know, is very useful. Then you can also measure at the wrong time. So if you want a good availability uh, measure, then you uh, tend to measure on, say, Tuesday morning because you've just replenished uh, over the weekend. Um, whereas, actually, what are your service levels or what are your, your uh, ulcer rates, basically, on a weekend uh, or at peak times um, or in, indeed uh, in the evening. So when you measure, you know, is going to affect uh, the perception uh, significantly. And then one of my favorites is actually, um, uh, actually being asked, if you like, you know, did you get everything that you, that you came in for, sir? Which, uh, being British, the general answer is yes, uh, largely because I've got three people behind me, I'm hungry and I actually want to go home and... Uh, cook the meal that I'm, I'm uh, uh, just bought for. So these are some of the symptoms, if you like, of, uh, of why there's a disconnect between um, the perceived on-shelf availability and the actual on-shelf on availability. So what's the right way of doing it? Well, the right way, the right place is from the consumer's perspective. Um, <clears throat> the right time is not actually when you've got a stock out or when you're, when you're out of stock. The right time is actually before. So being able to anticipate, being able to look at your particular sales rates, uh, determine uh, what you should be selling, and then be able to, uh, then if you deviate from that, then start to investigate through the data as to why that is and starting to, to get to the root cause. And that leads to the, to the, to the last area, which is the, the right process, which is effectively looking at that root cause and taking preventative action so that uh, you know, it doesn't happen in the first place. However, what we see 
in today's market is not this approach necessarily. What we see is a lot of fixing of today's problems. Um, so through things like gap scans, uh, we're seeing that, okay, you've already lost, lost sales. You've got, you've, uh, you've got an out-of-stock situation. And so then it's, it's, it's about uh, expensive interventions or, or remedies where effectively you're putting in another case of particular product <clears throat> um, and essentially uh, fixing that problem but, but too late. Also, from a manufacturer viewpoint, quite often you won't even know about these stockouts because you haven't necessarily got the information or the systems to be able to bring in that sales and stock uh, data at store level to be able to understand exactly what is, what is going on. So <clears throat> our recommended approach is, is a more proactive approach to that, um, to basically first measure it in the first place, then identify um, and uh, identify and alert the to what the, the the root cause to the most appropriate person who can actually take action uh, against that um, uh, out of stock. And what we're building towards is very much a preventative uh, mindset rather than a corrective mindset. Um, and that will take you know, some time to, to, to build. How do we uh, basically uh, come up with these, with these statistics? And essentially what we'll do is we'll take in store level inventory information, we'll take in store level uh, uh, sales, and we'll determine what the sales rate uh, actually should be. Uh, and from that, start to determine whether you've got to start to look at the root cause and in fact look at things like probability gaps so again if you're if you're a grocer and you haven't sold uh, a banana for an hour then actually you're you're out of stock definitely because bananas sell far, far more frequently than, uh, th than that so a lot of the time you can determine you know what that uh, sales rate should be uh, whether you're out of stock what is the root cause of that? You then go through your alerting process and then feed that back into your KPIs so that you can start to cause a virtual circle of improvement or continuous improvement within that. From the data, what other sorts of root cause can you determine? <clears throat> uh, well, phantom stop is a, is a, a regular one. Um, as I say, basically when you think you've got stock but haven't. Uh, the whole area of the supply chain, whether you've got the order has actually been placed, um, whether the order has actually been received, whether you've got a shrink or a wastage um, uh, issue with your stock file going down with no sales actually uh, taking place. Um, you can have negative stock because a lot, often the stock uh, is a calculated field uh, and therefore you can end up with, with negative stock. Um, <clears throat> stock on the shelf is, is a, uh, again, a common one where effectively you've got, uh, you've got basically uh, the supply chain has done its job and you've got stock in the back room, but it hasn't made it out the, the last 100 yards out onto the shelf itself. <clears throat> and then partial out of stock is basically where you, you're, selling up to say 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're replenishing it, you're then going out of stock, you're then replenishing at four o'clock in the afternoon. So you've got a time when you haven't uh, sold and that is actually a forecasting issue. So uh, you, know, you basically should be selling, uh, pushing more, more product into uh, that particular store at that point in time. So what you can determine is really four uh, areas uh, within this is one is whether you've got an information accuracy issue, whether you've got a forecasting issue, whether you've got a supply chain issue in actually getting the product uh, to the store, or whether you've got a store execution issue in actually re the replenishment of, of, of the shelves. <clears throat> we then take the, we then can segment alerts to go out to 
um, the relevant places, again, to, to uh, really solve that particular out of stock. So uh, <clears throat> when you've got a particular issue, if it's a DC issue, then you don't want to be alerting uh, the, the stores necessarily, but you want somebody to be able to, that can actually take control of that particular um, uh, issue and, and then rectify uh, that issue. <clears throat> and some of the, uh, if you've got a particular root cause where you can auto-correct, say at store, uh, store level, then that is a, um, a good thing to do because it's going to be hard otherwise. Then, then there's a full uh, analytic suite uh, behind this. So not only do you actually get your, your on-shelf availability uh, measure, but you can then look at you know, which, your, which your worst 10 stores or which your worst 10 uh, uh, products or on which day of the week is actually um, you know, your, your uh, lowest availability. Um, and again, why, why is that? And probably one of the most important things, you start to see a size of the prize against each of the root causes, so as well as, the, as, well as overall. So if you can pick off forecasting a, a, as a particular issue, then what is it actually worth to you as a company? And it can start to drive your own behavior um, within, within the con uh, your, your companies. And thinking about the size of the size of the prize, it's not just about customer dissatisfaction, if you like, because you've you've, you've gone out of stock. It can have much longer term in, uh, impacts than that. So if we take sales, for example, um, o uh, over a week, and we see that we're out of stock for uh, two of those days on the Monday and the Tuesday, then what what is the uh, figure that we actually put into our systems. Are we putting the actual sales that we've achieved, 59, or are we putting in our actual demand figure, which takes into account the lost sales uh, of 81? And we would obviously recommend that you're using the, the demand figure rather than the sales figure, because if you are using sales, then you are getting into a virtual circle where effectively you're not replenishing enough, you're going out of stock, and then you're not replenishing enough, and you're going out of stock, and so forth. So being able to capture the, the, uh, the time uh, and the expected sales for that time is vital information for your demand, uh, demand planning. The other area that you've got to should be looking at is basically your replenishment cycles. Um, <clears throat> and if your product uh, is stable um, or uh, essentially you can look at your history, then statistical forecasting you know, is a very well used and very legitimate um, uh, approach to this. Um, <clears throat> however, there are areas where statistical for forecasting just doesn't work. Uh, uh, in the real world, so they tend to be around new product introductions or short, uh, where you've got short shelf life, uh, and largely because uh, stat forecasting uh, will take about three weeks, three to four weeks before it will show up lifts in demand, whereas you need something uh, more dynamic. And so we use this. Um, demand driven approach which doesn't use history at all and just basically uh, segments your safety, your, your safety stocks into three areas and will then each re replenishment cycle will basically decide whether it should be uh, uh, keeping, keeping the stock level the same, imp improving that or increasing that stock level or in fact reducing uh, that stock level. You know, there are many places that this works extremely well but you know, fashion is an example um, whereby you've got lots of new product introductions, you, you haven't got history to, to that particular items, you've got short uh, product life cycles, and if you've only got an eight-week product life cycle and you're taking three to four weeks to start to realize that you've got an uplift in demand, then uh, you know, it's just not dynamic enough, whereas th this can change <clears throat> if you're replenishing, say, three times a week, within a week, then you're starting to adjust those stock levels according to your, your, your actual demand. This actually comes from uh, a 
supply chain management theory called theory of constraints. Um, <clears throat> we actually had to buy a company about eight years ago to get this algorithm to be able to do that. But what one thing that the theory of constraints really works on is um, trying to get uh, your stock levels effectively in the middle. Um, <clears throat> the bottom bit here is that TVD is a time value day, which is essentially your risk of out of stock. So you're trying to get your risk of out of stock down to zero. And your IVD, which is uh, inventory value day, is basically you're trying to get that down to, to, to zero. So as an example of uh, where we have done this, um, this is a, a global uh, manufacturer um, that we started off with. They had out of stocks of around 20 million uh, when, well, this is dollars, uh, when, we, when we started. Uh, and in just over a year, we managed to get that down to just below 5 million uh, in, in out of stocks. And then as far, because this was a high margin product, then actually uh, they, their overstock situation was around 80 million when we started off. Um, and again, in, in the same year, in the same uh, year that, uh, as the out of stocks, we basically brought this down to just below 10. And the other interesting thing here is to, to see, if you like, the velocity of the line here versus uh, actually the smoothness of how to start to, to, to bring it down. So, um, you know, th these uh, techniques, if you like, do work. Okay, so to start to, to wrap up, if you like, um, then what's the practical approach to addressing your out-of-stocks or your um, uh, on-shelf availability is one is you have to be able to measure it. And from that measurement, then start to determine what the root cause is. And, and um, then you would start to look at recurring out-of-stocks. And that, it may be that actually replenishment uh, is an area that, that's at fault and that, that can start to, to, to rectify those particular areas. <clears throat> we would recommend that you start at the beginning. What do we mean by that? You start, you start upstream. Um, uh, so uh, maybe it's, it's, it's actually probably forecasting is the easiest thing that you can change. You can change that quickly and you can make a dramatic effect as to uh, how that is um, uh, your actual results within the supply chain. Then <clears throat> alerting to the right person that I can actually do something about it. Fifthly, as I said, the store, the store goes last, so you fix the upstream problems first. And then you can start to get the, the value and the, uh, the ROI from that. What sort of tools do you need to be able to do that? Uh, you need to be able to measure it. Uh, you need to have that alerting capability to, 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 the, right, to, to the right side, to the right people. Um, <clears throat> you then also need to be uh, wary of things like... Um, distribution voids and so forth. Now, what a distribution void is, is that basically within a, uh, a particular outlet, you might have a fast selling uh, uh, product that actually sells out and then the store manager comes over and puts in other products, maybe at a slower, uh, slower rate, and you actually fill the gap. And depending on your store ordering, you can then stop ordering that fast seller that has sold out in the first place. Uh, and <clears throat> that effectively means that you, what, not only do, are you losing sales for that particular product, but since it's one of your fast sellers, you're u losing one of your fast sellers, uh, and it essentially gets um, uh, left out of the ordering process. You need to have, uh, because we're talking about different systems <clears throat> to pull these together, basically integration. Uh, then you've got um, consulting so that you can actually Know what, you're, know what you're actually doing. But then last but not least is basically collaboration. So um, actually starting to bring your trading partners uh, involved in this whole, whole area. So essentially, um, that's what I wanted to say today. Um, and uh, if you're interested in improving your on-shelf availability, then we have got to stand down in the, uh, 
the main hall. So thank you very much.